Hmm. Hello from National Geographic Education. My name is Levette Dukes and this is Explorer Classroom. At National Geographic, we use the power of science, exploration, education, and storytelling to illuminate and protect the wonder of our world. Explorer Classroom connects students worldwide with our National Geographic Explorers for short lessons and time for your questions. This school year, each month will be organized around a specific theme. This October, Explorer Classroom will be exploring the importance of water conservation. Today, our explorer is Enrique Lomnens. Enrique, we are so happy to have you here. You come to us from Mexico, Mexico City specifically, and we want to hear all about what you have to share with us today. Before we get into today's lesson, I'd like to welcome our registered viewers who join, who are joining us live. And we have Ms. Riddle's Classroom from South Carolina. So excited to have you here with us live, along with all of our YouTube viewers. We are thrilled to have all of you here. And with that, let's get this Explorer Classroom started. Enrique Lomnitz, take it away. Thank you so much, Vivette. Hi, guys. It's super good to be sharing with all you kids. I'm super stoked and super pumped. Uh, my name is Enrique Lomnitz. And as Vivette said, I am a National Geographic Explorer, which I think is like pretty awesome. Um, and as cool as that is, the reason I got here is because of something that's not so cool, actually. Um, and that is that the place that I come from, Mexico City, is a place that's going through a very, very, very serious problem. And the problem is that the whole city, the whole city is is slowly running out of water. And it's actually kind of completely crazy if you think about it, you know, a city running out of water. And I'm going to tell you guys the story of how that's happening and what we can try and do about it. But before I do that, I wanted to tell you guys a little bit about myself. So my name is Enrique Lomnitz, as I said, and when I was a kid, when I was your age and even younger, I was like really into animals. Like I loved animals. I still do. But when I was a kid, my house was like a zoo. I had like all kinds of pets. I had turtles. I had birds. I had mice. I had fish. Uh, I remember one time I came into my room and I had this like five foot long iguana and it was like it had gotten out of its cage and it was in this like standoff with the cat. So like the cat was on one side and like the iguana was on the other side, like waving its tail around in the air. And that was my childhood. I was like surrounded by animals. I was always picking up animals. I'd find animals, you know, on the street in the countryside and I'd bring them home. And and I absolutely loved them. No, I'd, I'd find tadpoles and I'd make these elaborate fish tanks and I'd make whole ecosystems and I'd watch the tadpoles turn into frogs. I really, really loved all of these animals. Um, and in fact, I'm going to show you a little picture just so you guys get a sense of me. This is me when I was probably in like second or third grade with a pet chicken that I had. This is in an apartment in New York and I was like raising chickens in my apartment. So I really, really loved animals. And that love of animals kind of brought me into a more general thing of really just loving nature and thinking it was really, really important for people and nature to kind of get along better. You know, I wanted us human beings to have a relationship with nature that was in better harmony, you know, that was more loving. But I was a little kid, so I had no idea of what actually to do. You know, so another thing about me is that I'm from Mexico, Mexico, as Vivette said, uh, and Mexico is this really big country. It's right next to the U.S. Maybe some of you guys don't know quite where it is. So I'll show you a little picture of where it is right here. It's this little red guy here. It's this big country. It's really, really beautiful place. I mean, it's got all kinds of good stuff going on. No, it's full of really, really friendly people, like super friendly people. The landscapes are gorgeous. It has forests and jungles and deserts and beaches. It has all of this good stuff going. The food is amazing. No, it's this really, really wonderful country. 
but it also has a really big problem. And one of its many big problems, or the one that I'm talking about, is that there's a lot of places that have a lot of poverty. And even when I was a little kid, the same way that I like loved animals, I like really hated seeing the poverty. I really hated the fact that there's all these people that didn't have like really basic things that they needed, you not know? like people that had to uh, that had to go through so much work and had such a hard time just to have basic things that other people took for granted. You know? So I wanted to do something about that as well. And this whole kind of story, as I grew up, my love of nature and animals and my you know, desire to see people that were in these hard times with poverty have a better life um, brought me to something that became really important to me. I met this, this woman who became one of my best friends. I met her at school and her name is Renata. And Renata, who I'm going to show you a picture of now too, this is Renata. She's just this like super cool woman. And she was also from Mexico city. And she was just like me. Like she loved nature. She wanted to do something about poverty. She loved Mexico and wanted to help her country. And so Renata and I were both kind of together. We both wanted to do something about these things that we're interested in. Uh, but you know, we were still very young. We weren't little kids anymore, but we were still very young. We weren't really sure what we could do about these problems that we were so worried about. So one day, Renata and I got on a bus in Mexico City, and we went way south, south of the city, way, way to the edge of the city, up a mountain. And we were going to a very poor part of the city, a very, very poor neighborhood. And we were going to go visit this woman who we knew, whose name was Clara, Clara. And Clara was this woman who was very wise. She was very wise, very intelligent woman, uh, but she was very poor. She lived in a very poor part of town. And Renata and I wanted to just talk to her and see what problems she had that maybe we could help with. And that's all. You know, we just wanted to talk to Clara and see if there was something we could do to help her and the people in her neighborhood. And so Clara started telling the story of her life. And I'm going to show you guys a picture of Clara, too, because I want you guys to meet her. This is Clara. She's this beautiful woman, this really interesting woman. She lived in this neighborhood. So you can see it was a very poor neighborhood. People didn't even have enough money to paint their houses. You know? And Clara told us the story of when she was young. And Clara is a Native American from Mexico. She's from a group called Mistecans from the south of Mexico. And when Clara was growing up, she lived in a little house with dirt walls and no electricity and no running water. And they grew their own food. And every two or three days, Clara and her mom and her brothers and sisters would take like bottles and buckets and they'd walk for like two hours. Imagine that. They'd walk for like two hours to a river and they'd fill up their buckets and they'd fill up all their little bottles with water and they'd put the little tops on and they'd carry that water back home. And that's the water that they had at home to work with. And that's like really hard because most of us, we just open a tap and there's the water. No, And Clara, when she was a kid, she had to do so much work just to get this little bit of water. And now that Clara lived in the city, she was, you know, she now she had a tap just like us, but she told us that a lot of the times she would open the tap and nothing would come out. Water wouldn't come out of the taps. And she told us also something interesting, which is that over time, water would come out of the tap less and less. Like she used to open the tap and most of the times there'd be water, but now she'd open the tap and like only sometimes there would be water. And she didn't really know what was going on, but she said, hey, you know, I think maybe our city is running out of water. And you know what? She was right, which is completely crazy. And this brings us back to the beginning of our story, you know, the crazy fact that the city that I come from, the whole city is actually running out of water. And before going on, I just wanted us to take a little second to like think about kind of how crazy and serious that is, you know? Uh, think of all the things that you use water for, you know? You, you bathe, you shower, you wash your dishes, you know, think about how good that water feels when you take a warm shower, you know, or when it's really hot out and you're doing exercise and you take like a drink of cold water. Like water is one of the most beautiful and important parts of our lives. You know? Like imagine just how grave and serious it is for a city to be running out of water. 
And so I want to tell you guys a little bit of how that happens. Like, how is it possible that a whole city can run out of water? And how's that going on? No, and what we can do about it, which is really the most important part of all this. So the first question about how a city runs out of water starts with, you know, where does the water come from? You know? And in, in you guys' houses, probably, as in mine, I mean, the easiest, simplest answer is it comes out of the top, right? Turn the top, water comes out, that's where the water comes from. But the water, like, doesn't come from the top. Like, it comes from somewhere and comes out of the top. So where does that water come from? No. And, I mean, the next, I guess, easiest answer is, well, it comes from the pipes that bring the water to the top. And that's true. The water comes from the pipes that come to the top that we use in our houses. But where does that water come from? And that is a question that has a different answer depending on where you are in the world. But in my city, in Mexico City, the water that comes out of the taps, the water that goes into the pipes, almost all of it comes from something called an aquifer. You know? And an aquifer, what is an aquifer, you might ask? You know? An aquifer... And I'm going to explain this by going a little bit backwards and asking you to imagine again, when it rains and all the rain falls on the ground and the ground is like grass and soil and dirt or a forest or something, that water falls on the ground and where does it go? Well, it sinks into the ground, right? Like you guys have seen it. Ground gets wet, water sinks down. Now that water that sinks into the ground, some of that goes into the plants. No, it gets absorbed by the plants. Some of the just like evaporates out of the ground, but a lot of that water actually just keeps on going down. It keeps on sinking into the ground deeper and deeper and deeper until it starts pooling up and accumulating underground. So underground, there's like little caves and there's like spaces between the rocks and there's sand and there's like all kinds of stuff underground and all that can slowly fill up with water and it can fill up with like a lot of water, you no, know, over like hundreds of years or like thousands or even millions of years, the spaces underground fill up with water and that's called an aquifer, all of that water that's stored underground. And if you dig a hole and you dig deep enough, you can actually reach that water and you can start pulling water out of that hole. And that hole, guess what, is called a well. No? So that's what a well is. A well is a hole in the ground that goes down into the groundwater and into the aquifers. And that's where the water comes from in Mexico City. And I'll show you a little kind of drawing of what that looks like too, so that you guys can imagine it. This is kind of what it would look like. No? What you see on top is like the landscape, the city, and all those little tubes or wells that are going down into all these different layers underground, and they go down into layers underground that are full of water, and that's called an aquifer, and that's where the water comes from in my city. Mexico City is built on a really big aquifer. It's like a gigantic aquifer. It took a really, really long time to fill up, and we have thousands and thousands of wells that go deep, deep down underground and pull water out of that aquifer, but there's a problem a really big problem. And that's that, you know, before rainwater used to fall and it used to filter down into the ground and fill the aquifer, like we said. But as the city started to grow, we started building houses and streets and parking lots. And we started paving over everything. We started paving over the ground to such a degree that the water really didn't have a way to get into the ground anymore. What we started having was drains and the water would go into the drains or it would just pool up on top of all that pavement. Like we can see in this picture, it's just water going into the drains. It can't filter into the soil anymore. And at the same time, the city was growing. So there were more and more people and we needed more and more water. And so we started digging more and more wells. So at first we had like a few wells. Then we had like a bunch of wells. Then we have thousands and thousands and thousands of wells going down into the ground, pulling water out of the ground more and more so that all these people that need water can have water. But at the same time, the water can't go into the ground anymore. So imagine that. You know? Imagine this aquifer, this big pool of water underground. And you take water out of that, more and more water, you pull water out of the ground, but the water can't get back in because you've paved over everything on top. So it's not filling back up again. And when you do that, you start getting less and less water in the aquifer. And that basically is how my city is slowly running out of water. 
And this is a really serious problem because Mexico City is really, really big. Like, I mean, like really, really big. Like there's 22 million people that live in Mexico City. And 22 million people is crazy. It's like almost unthinkable how many people it is. Like if 22 million people held hands and made a line, they could reach from New York City to Australia making a line of people holding hands. And that's how many people live in my city running out of water. And so, you know, you can only imagine how big a problem it is. It's, it's almost impossible to imagine how big of a problem it is if this many people run out of water. And people would have to leave. They'd have to leave their homes. They'd have to leave everything they've built to go look for other places to live, you know, if we don't find a solution to this problem. So we have to find a solution to this problem. And that's what Renata and I got really into because, you know, we wanted to solve a problem. We loved Clara. Clara already was having a problem that she'd open the tap and no water would come out. And we wanted to do something about this. And so we said, hey, you know, you know, what, what can we do about this? And we started thinking, you know, it rains, you know, all this rain still falls. It's just not going into the ground anymore. It's going into a drain that then takes it out of the city and takes it far, far away into the ocean. But it rains and it doesn't just rain. Like in Mexico City, it rains a lot, like so much rain. I've seen cars floating down the street because the streets turn into rivers when it rains and the rain has nowhere to go. And so it just pulls up and the whole street turns into a river and the whole thing starts turning into a lake. I've seen cars like ice cubes floating down the street. And so Renata and I started thinking, you know, what, what if we could somehow get all of this rain that's going into the sewer? What if we could put that into the pipes so that that water could come out of the taps and then people like Clara could have water again without, you know, without needing to, to keep on digging more wells, which is a big part of this problem. And so we went to Clara and we said, hey, Clara, what if we take the rainwater that's falling on your house? What if we put that into pipes? And what if you and your family could use that water? And Clara loved it. She was super pumped. She was like, yes, let's try this. We got to try this. And so we went to Clara's house. I'm going to show you guys another picture of back in these days and how Clara was super pumped. This is Clara, Renata, and me, and Clara's little baby grandson. And she was super pumped. And we all got together and we thought about this. And Clara said, okay, we're going to put a tank in one of the rooms of my house. We're going to put a big water tank and we're going to put pipes from the roof of my house so that the water that falls on the roof, we're going to put it into pipes and we're going to put it into this tank. And here's that tank. And we did it. We built it. And the next time it rained, boom, boom, Clara's tank was full of water. And it was like full of water. You could see it in this picture. It was like full of water and it was crystal clear. And it was so full of water that it started overflowing. Like it kept on raining and water was like pouring out the sides of the tank. And everybody was just jumping up and down. We were so, so happy. And we were hugging and we were with Gladys family. And we were like doing these like little rain dances. And we were celebrating because we had like been able to make this whole tank fill up with water. And we were just so, so incredibly excited that we'd been able to do this really simple thing with Clara. And Clara's family was able to go eight months, imagine eight whole months out of the year, just using rainwater. They didn't need any water from outside. They could just store and catch so much rain that most of the year during the whole rainy season, all they used was rainwater. And this was so exciting to us. We were so pumped that we decided to keep on doing this. And so we founded an organization. We founded an organization called Isla Urbana. And that organization has been working on how to make as many people as possible start harvesting rainwater the way Gladys family does. And this organization has been like one of the most fun things in the world because we started Renata and me, but then all these other people, all these other people that were also worried about the world, they were worried about how people in nature get along better. They were worried about our city running out of water. They wanted to do something good with their lives. And we all started teaming up together, more and more people, more and more people. Today, there's about 100 of us, 100 people all working together to try and get as many people as we possibly can to be able to harvest rainwater. And we've gotten really good at it. We've made these beautiful rainwater harvesting systems like this one. This is a tank with a big, beautiful flower on it. 
and the water that falls on the roof goes into this tank. And this family that didn't have any water now has this big tank of water and they don't have to walk like Clara's family used to walk to the river. They just go to their tank, open a tap, and they have water right there in their houses. And we've installed about 30,000 rainwater harvesting systems. So there's about 30,000 families like Claras that are today harvesting rainwater. And we catch so much water. These are barrels that you can see in this picture. These are barrels that people, this is a poor part of Mexico City where people get their water from water trucks. So a lot of people store their water in these barrels. If you took barrels like these and filled them with the rainwater that we're catching with all of these systems every year, and you stacked up these barrels every year, it'd be 4,000 times as tall as the Empire State Building. And this is the Empire State Building right here. And I don't know if you can see it on the very bottom. There's like a little tiny dude that's like the size of a person, just for reference of how tall the Empire State Building is. If you stacked these barrels up with all the rainwater that we catch every year in Mexico City, 4,000 times as tall as the Empire State Building. So it's been a really, really fun and beautiful experience catching all this rainwater with people. And that's really what we've been doing since. And so it's become this like adventure of catching water, learning how to catch water, working with communities to catch water. And this has been an incredible thing. It, well, first of all, it helped me fulfill this dream that I had of trying to do something good for my city beginning with Clara, but then moving to so many other people, it made me a National Geographic Explorer, which is like so cool. Like I still think it's just so cool that like now I'm part of this beautiful community of people all over the world trying to solve problems. And what I take out of this and what I'd really like to share with you guys, all you kids, is when you really have an intention like this, when you're really, really concerned about something, you're really worried about a problem that affects your town or your city or your family or anything like that, you can actually really turn it into your job and you can work on this and you can make a whole project and a whole life out of trying to solve a problem might even make you a National Geographic Explorer one day. And that is what I wanted to share with you guys today. So that's my story. And I'm very excited to take any questions that you guys have. You guys can ask me absolutely anything about this adventure. And I'm going to share back to Vivette right now so that um, so that we can hear whatever questions you guys have on your minds. Wow. Thank you so much, Enrique, for an incredible look into your work and into why water access and sustainability are so important. I bet many of our viewers are interested in joining your mission. Could you let us know again, how can we support your work in our communities? Ah, oh, thank you, Vivette. That's a great question. But I would kind of flip it around a little bit because you guys can help my organization help people in Mexico have more water for sure. But I would begin by asking something a little different, which is what problems are there in you guys' communities that you guys are interested in? Because my city's running out of water, but maybe your city doesn't have that same problem. Your city might have a completely different problem. You no, know, your city might have a problem that there's a lot of homeless people that don't have a place to live, you no, know? or your city might have a lot of pollution, or your city might have, I don't know, all kinds of problems. It might not have enough trees and enough parks. You no, know? every place in every city has its own kinds of problems. So, what I'd like to suggest to you guys, uh, and this you can take it almost as like a little piece of homework, except you don't, you know, it's not homework, it's like a suggestion. No, but that's to really start thinking of problems that you care about and start young. You guys are kids right now, but it's never too early to start really looking around and thinking what moves you No, know, what problems does your city have that you're actually worried about? No, like I used to love animals. What do you love? No, what are you worried about conserving or keeping or protecting or trying to help grow and be stronger in your city? And once you think of something like that, that you are actually worried about or that you really care about, try to start learning more about it. Try to start researching it. Try to understand what that problem is. No, Remember when Renata and I talked to Clara and she told us that water wasn't coming out of the tap, we didn't really know why. 
No, we had to go and learn about the problem and we researched and we asked people and we realized that there was this problem with the aquifer in Mexico City that was shrinking because we were getting too much water out and not putting enough water back in. No, we learned that and we didn't know it at first. So whatever problem you're worried about, I'd say start learning about it, really start learning about it. And as you start learning about it, start keeping your mind open for ideas. No, what could you do about it? Like if your city, like my city has a problem that it's all paved over and the rainwater can't go back down into the ground, maybe we should have more parks. Maybe we should have less pavement and more green spaces. No, you start learning and thinking about possible solutions as you start learning more about the problems. So you guys can support Isla Urbana, which is my organization in all kinds of ways. You can make donations, you can organize people to talk about the problem and simply raise like more awareness and consciousness. But I would say, think about your own places. Think about your city, wherever you're from. You know, if you're from Detroit, if you're from New Delhi, if you're from New York City, if you're from LA, if you're from Mexico City, if you're from Bogota in Colombia, your city is going to have its own kinds of problems. And problems usually don't solve themselves. Problems get solved when people who care start trying to solve those problems. So that would be what I'd say to you guys. And hopefully you guys get on the path of becoming people who, starting as children, growing up into adults, are the kind of people that solve big problems. Thank you, Enrique, again, for being with us today and for sharing your story with us. And thank you to all of the students and teachers watching. We hope you join many, many more of our events. We'll be right back here next week, Thursday, October 20th, with Pristine Seas Expedition Leader Paul Rose, one of the world's most accomplished science divers, to learn how the National Geographic Pristine Seas team is exploring the ocean, inspiring marine reserves, and conducting scientific research overall. And be sure to tune in next Wednesday, October 19th for the fourth and final event in our special series, Live from the Nautilus. We'll be joined by the Maritime Heritage Team led by National Geographic Explorer, Justin Donovan, to learn how they will create virtual 3D models of key underwater cultural heritage sites in Maui and Lanai in order to document them and raise awareness for their preservation. Teachers, remember, register for more than one event in this series for a chance to win a special prize for your classroom. Register for, register for this event and for more events at natgeoed.org forward slash explorer classroom. You can request a chance to be featured on screen with us during the registration process. Fellow teachers, we've also created a new interactive guide for you to share with your students to take them on a learning journey with each of our special guests. Find the Explorer Mindset in Action Guide and Teacher Edition linked on each event reservation, excuse me, registration page. Have a great day, everyone. Stay curious and remember, keep exploring. Thank you.